Okay, so uh, it's it's a great pleasure to to present this this talk that that would be given by uh, Lucia Bravidu, who is a full professor in the University of Groningen and the director of the Center for Learning and Teaching, and also um, Ana Maria Jaramillo, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Vienna, are studying. Um, complexity and complex phenomena, and in particular, inequalities in STEM. Yes, I got that right. Otherwise, you can correct me. And so the floor, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hola, buenos dias. Uh, muchas gracias por la invitación. Uh, Ana Maria will do the rest in, in real Spanish, Ana Maria. Uh, Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm super excited that um, uh, last minute uh, Ana Maria is joining uh, this talk uh, because she is doing some really fascinating research uh, in this area. Um, so um, let me try to share my slides. Maybe I'll start by sharing a little bit about myself. Uh, so, you know, who I am and why I'm doing uh, what I'm doing. Also a bit more personal info. Uh, I do. I come from Cyprus. Um, but I, I've been living in the Netherlands for six, seven years now. Um, I'm in generally, I'm interested in issues related to borders and border crossing uh, because I do come from a conflicting uh, society and uh, uh, by refugees. I was raised by parents who were refugees. Um, and my work is at the, at the intersection of physics and education with a um, strong focus on issues around identity, social justice, uh, and inequalities. I'm very much interested in um, experiences that shape people's lives or decisions, and um, specifically students, uh, especially in relation to careers in science. So you see in one of these pictures is uh, myself, my niece and my nephew. I'm trying to brainwash them to uh, engage with, with science. Um, but I'm mostly interested in, uh, in uh, how environments outside of school or experiences out of, outside of school might shape our decisions to engage with specific uh, subjects mm -hmm. or disciplines. And of course, I'm a, I'm a feminist and I'm a big advocate of uh, gender equality or equity. And, and that's the main reason that uh, Nine, well, hundred percent of my team now are are women. Uh, I do have a team of uh, close to fifty people now uh, in Groningen, and we all engage with issues around uh, STEM education and um, inequalities in STEM access, inclusion, exclusion, uh, and so on. And I pass it on to Anna Maria to introduce herself as well before we dive into uh, more theoretical. Um, Issues. Thank you, Thank you uh, Lucy. So, uh, hi everyone. Hola a todos. <laughs> Gracias por la invitación. Um, so, I'm Ana Maria Jaramillo. I'm a postdoctoral research um, fellow at the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna, not the University of Vienna. Uh, and um, the work that I'll present here uh, is about uh, a project in common that we have with Lu Lucy uh, and with uh, uh, Fariba Karimi that also joined and Jab Backman uh, from my lab. So we are uh, measuring fairness in citation rankings and bias uh, mitigation strategies uh, about with gender lenses and uh, also with multi attributes and more intersectional uh, lenses. And I think you put the next slide also uh, mine for the... Um, let me see why it's not... Yeah. yeah. So this is uh, a bit like why I'm doing <laughs> what I'm doing. So uh, I've been following a path, um, a career path towards understanding social systems under the complexity approach. And uh, so I'm from Colombia, I'm from Bogota. I've been in the US as a research visitor. I finished uh, my PhD in computer science at the University of Exeter in the UK, studying segregation and, and sociology uh, of science, uh, but with big data and data intensive methods. And um, I am uh, advocating a lot and my work <laughs> and uh, what, uh, makes me passionate 
Uh, it's about mitigating intersectional biases. So right now in citation rankings and uh, strongly promoting social demographic uh, and epistemological diversity in science. So uh, I'm industrial engineering by training, but I've been working a lot uh, with epidemiologists, so co uh, psychologists, sociologists, research policy. I really believe in inter intersectionality uh, and I've been working uh, with a lot of uh, strong uh, women role models uh, in science. So uh, for me, uh, when I uh, read all what I've shown you <laughs> later um, in my results and with the theoretical um, theoretical uh, studies that Lucy has been conducted, for me, is, uh, I don't understand it because I've been privileged in a bubble <laughs> uh, in which I'm collaborating with a lot of uh, like women in science. And uh, I'm here uh, to show that to you after Lucy's presentation. Thanks a lot, Ana Maria, and thanks a lot for joining in a very uh, late minute uh, notice. Uh, so the, the reason I invited Ana Maria to join is because um, we do work on this uh, horizon project uh, together that aims to mitigate uh, AI ethics and, and biases, um, but mostly it's because we um, target the same goals, but through very different methodologies. I use uh, life stories and very small case uh, uh, research, and while Anna Maria is using uh, big data methodologies. But the, the two, if you bring the two together, uh, kind of offer a really um, the big picture. Uh, so I would like to start the, this talk with uh, kind of setting the ground, uh, the basics. And, and I guess the, the main thing that um, this is something that I use in, in every talk is that there is no evidence through neuroscience that uh, there are gender differences uh, that are not socially constructed, that all gender differences uh, are <clears throat> socially constructed. And... Uh, and I draw from uh, the work from Cordelia Fine, a neuroscientist, and her work with uh, 20 years of uh, large scale uh, set uh, data. So, society, uh, neurosexism, our uh, cultural uh, factors are what uh, create uh, gender differences. And here I'm showcasing a couple of uh, examples from the minute, um, from the moment that, uh, that we are born, uh, society kind of conveys certain messages or expectations from, uh, from boys and girls. And, and this is one classic example pink is for girls uh, and blue is for boys. Or if you enter a, a toy store, you see a section for toys for girls and a section um, with toys for, for boys. Uh, machines also is another um, source of uh, these uh, cultural stereotypes or expectations or sexism also. Uh, here is a kind of a very uh, brief example. Uh, if you type in Google physicists, these are the images uh, that you uh, that you get to see. Uh, so if my if my niece, I have a niece who is uh, 13 years old and she had to do biographies uh, for, for her, one of her assignments at, at school, she had to do biographies of, uh, of physicists and they were provided from the school with a list of physicists and all, there were 10 people and all 10 uh, were men and um, half of them were also dead. So um, schools, another source of... Um, cultural stereotypes or communication of specific uh, expectations from uh, girls and boys. Um, Lucy, uh, yeah. we'll stop sharing. sharing yeah, screen. I want to share a, a video, um, but let me see. It's a very brief video, um, two minutes long. This is a... Um, And I think it has Spanish subtitles as well. This is an advertisement from Horizon, a telephone company in the US. Uh, that It was a part of a campaign, actually. But I think it kind of showcases uh, what I'm trying, what I have encapsulated through my research in, in only 10, two minutes. Uh, let me know if the sound comes across OK. No, no sound. Uh, 
Oops. Sorry. I hope that the sound uh, was okay. So, why I wanted to share that is uh, because I think, in my view, it kind of showcases how um, the feedback that we receive constantly from the society, from the media, from our parents, also have uh, have an impact on. Uh, decisions or how we see ourselves as scientists and we know from research and my own uh, work as well that uh, feedback from parents from the immediate family environment has a huge impact on students young children's decisions and then we're here uh, um, in 2023, with uh, these are data from uh, UNESCO, um, with only 26% of uh, STEM researchers, not necessarily in, in physics, are, are women. Now, this uh, percentage probably drops when, um, um, when we have a look at physics. Um, here is another example. These are statistics from the European Institute for Gender Equality in 2014. How many people work in STEM? It's, uh, only 14% are women. But what I really like um, in this uh, picture is that um, uh, it shows with this uh, um, brief image the toys or the tools that uh, boys and girls come to use throughout their lives and how different uh, those are and as you see there are many more opportunities typically for boys to to engage with science through play for example or through everyday uh, life activities um, here is a bit more uh, information, statistics about the number of students and, and I'm sharing these university students and I'm sharing it because I want to showcase that it's a problem that cuts across different levels, the workplace, the university uh, level, but also uh, at the primary through secondary school level. Um, so here are some trends uh, in the numbers. Um, the first one is that the gap between in, uh, women and men remain consistent throughout the period of uh, these 10 years. Women are 50 to 70 percent less likely to complete a master's degree in STEM subjects uh, than their male counterparts. Twice as many STEM male graduates continues to STEM employment and this speaks uh, uh, on the issue of retention. Women mainly graduated in disciplines such as health and welfare, humanities and arts, along uh, with social sciences, business uh, and law, while men graduated in engineering, uh, manufacturing and other uh, STEM disciplines. So um, another major difference. And why is this a problem? One might argue in um, uh, the European level, at least Europe is facing a shortage of scientists, um, but perhaps most importantly, from a diversity point of view, productivity point of view, we know that the large, the lack of gender diversity limits uh, performance at workplace. And now I'm going to transition into sharing a bit more uh, information or rationale why uh, we should be engaging uh, with more work in physics. First one is that obviously it, it has been and it still is a world uh, without women. And here I'm sharing um, a really classic book uh, that was uh, published a few years ago with title A World Without Women. This was a study into um, the nature of 
of science. And here are the, this, is, this was done from a social scientist. And what the main findings of this work was that there is a very strict separation of subject and object. Um, there is priority of the objective over the subjective. Um, modern science is typically depersonalized and disembodied and has a disembodied discourse. Um, it's portrayed as asocial uh, from any other identities of the scientists. It requires a total commitment to the colleague, which comes in contrast with, uh, for example, having family, raising children. Um, and, and essentially, it kind of uh, it portrays an incompatibility between these different identities, between being a scientist and being a parent, um, being a partner, and so on. And it's uh, it it, uh, it has been alienated from a threat um, of women. And another classic book that I usually draw upon, it's called Beam Times uh, and Lifetimes, and this is work done by Sharon Trawek, an ethnographer, who um, compare the, the, the culture through ethnography of different of laboratories of high energy physicists in Europe and in Japan. And the findings of this work is that in cultural differences, there were no cultural differences. So the culture of physics kind of beats every social culture. And essentially physics is portrayed as a culture of no culture. Um, scientific practice requires a very objective, rational, asocial, decontextualized uh, researcher. And all these come in contrast with femininity. So here is how essentially the culture of science uh, and physics is portrayed as dehumanizing, unwelcoming, as a very competitive environment, which again comes in contrast with femininity, and it's a very masculine culture. It requires um, masculine performances uh, of gender. And who is left out? Uh, Anyone essentially who, who is not enacting or performing these types of identities uh, is left out. Uh, different diversities, Muslim women is one example, disabled uh, bodies, um, more people who work in more collaborative or collective way, um, um, and so on. Uh, so here I'm going to share a couple of examples from, from my work. Uh, and in general, in my work in the past uh, 15 years, at least, I engage with questions on who aspires to be a physicist. So I'm interested in, uh, in understanding how people form up aspirations and what factors or influences shape their decisions. I'm also interested in examining who is recognized as a competent physicist, and this refers to the feedback uh, that people receive from their environment, either that it's a family environment, school teachers, uh, or university teachers, or peers. Who has access uh, to physics, uh, essentially what supports and what hinders participation in physics, and essentially what identities are deemed in and out of place um, in physics. And I'm sharing drawing here on uh, two recent papers, uh, uh, case studies. And this one was a life history uh, of, a, of a Muslim woman who was born in Turkey, studied in the US, and moved to the Netherlands to work. Um, and I collected data through different tools. Uh, but my data uh, go back to memories of her childhood, uh, conversations she had with uh, parents at the age of six, seven years old, experiences that she had at school uh, through university instructor, through university teachers and then instructors at the university. Um, I examine how religion serve as a barrier to how others, uh, specific others, mostly from the West, saw her as a successful uh, or not physicist. How she was perceived by her students uh, at the at the university, and how she was perceived by the society, uh, but also by the by her peers, and and the main findings of this work is that essentially these identities uh, serve as a barrier to how she was recognized uh, by others. So put simply, 
she was not recognized as a competent physicist because uh, she was young, a very young woman in a department uh, populated by men. Uh, she was the only uh, Muslim uh, woman and um, she was the one, she was the only one that had a, a very diverse ethnic uh, background. And all these, these identities uh, have been in a very, had a very negative impact on how she was perceived uh, by others. Uh, this is a follow-up study here. I use three cases. Um, one is, is the same one, uh, this Muslim woman uh, from Turkey. Another one is a um, woman of color, uh, a student from India. And here uh, I was interested in examining especially how her ethnicity or race intersected with her physics identity and gender and how she was recognized or not by her, um, her peers, parents, uh, again, uh, as well as teachers. And another woman, uh, a white woman, upper class uh, woman, and also a single mother. So what I'm trying, what I try to do with this single, with this multiple case study is to examine how different kinds of identity intersections might support or hinder recognition. And the, the main findings of this work is that, um, similarly to the other one, is that, for example, motherhood comes in contrast with per the perception of a successful physicist. Um, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are, are, are seen are, as more likely to not succeed, succeed in physics versus um, physicists from upper uh, social class. Uh, race, women of color uh, specifically are seen as not, uh, again, uh, not successful or with high, less probability to succeed, uh, succeed in, in science and, and religion, especially Islam, um, is, uh, comes in contrast with uh, being a successful physicist in the West, at least, because there is work uh, that shows that in Muslim majority countries, this is not true. Um, and now I'm going to move on to, um, to share the findings of a, a comprehensive literature review that I carried with uh, colleagues from Sweden and Canada. We kind of synthesized the work that has been done on uh, general gender and STEM uh, in the past uh, 10 years. Um, the first finding is that the majority of the studies focus on an examination of gender through a biological sex, uh, through a binary approach, examining uh, essentially equating sex and gender, um, looking at males and females. And what's the problem is that is that we're missing insights on uh, gender as performance, masculinity or femininity. And one example I have to share with you. To showcase the importance of that is, for example, women, biologically female um, uh, people, who are in a way forced to act in a masculine, uh, through masculine ways in order to fit in, in, in departments. Another issue with this binary approach is that uh, it's non-inclusive of transgender and non-binary performances, which there has been um, increasing attention uh, in the past uh, few years. And in reviewing the literature, um, we kind of organize this chapter in different sections. And one of them is about um, performance of students. And the main finding on that is that female students outperform male students um, in, in, um, in terms of performance in physics uh, in different parts of the world. So this, uh, this review uh, synthesizes uh, findings from studies in different parts of the world. Um, so cognitive ability, there, uh, there are no, no differences uh, in, in cognitive ab abilities. On the contrary, uh, female students perform better than, than men. Um, in the global north, uh, this is very interesting and showcases the impact of early life experiences. Uh, children as young as six years old subscribe to the stereotype of mathematics and science 
as male uh, domains. And this showcases how strong these gender science stereotypes are. Um, there is substantial evidence that suggests that stereotype threat can impact career choice, retention, and performance of, uh, of women in science. And there is some research um, in Europe, especially, that showcases that uh, stereotypes and biases lead to dis discriminatory practices, and for example, hiring and promotion uh, procedures. Another theme of this, of this review is, uh, is around interest, self-efficacy, and belonging. And what we see in the literature is that male and female students have different interests uh, towards science studies and careers. Um, very generally, uh, boys have much more higher self-efficacy uh, or confidence uh, than girls, despite the fact that actually girls are doing better uh, uh, than boys. Um, and the sense of belonging is a very uh, useful contrast. And what we know from research is that uh, girls and women in, in physics uh, don't have a strong sense of belonging in the field. Harassment and microaggressions, this is mostly at the, um, at the workforce level, university level, and industry level as well. And we do have uh, many several studies that uh, provide evidence of gender discrimination uh, in science, with physics and astrophysics and planetary science being um, the top one. Uh, types of uh, these type of types of harassment and microaggressions, sexual objectification, language, sexist jokes, and denial of sexism. And this is very evident in the northern part of, uh, of Europe, especially. Um, so what we see more, more recently in the, in the literature, the studies I share so far are studies that were done early in 2000. Uh, the past five years, at least, we see a shift in the literature towards an examination of, of identity. So we move away from interest, self-efficacy, and sense of belonging, and we use identity as a kind of overarching uh, construct that um, that uh, utilizes all these different other constructs, uh, motivation, interest, and so on. But what identity does is that it offers us the, the tools and the lens to examine uh, participation in, in physics in conjunction with other types of identities like religion, um, social class, uh, motherhood, uh, for example. Um, there is also a shift towards exam, toward, away from the binary ex uh, examination to, um, to an ex examination of masculinity and femininity, so an examination of gender as performance instead of a static um, contracts, construct. And there is a shift on, uh, finally, on, on an examination of the environment and not the self. So, so we have witnessed, in, uh, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, different trainings and programs that aim to empower women, provide role models uh, from women, essentially to fix women, instead of uh, fixing the environment um, where they work, or fixing others, addressing biases and stereotypes uh, by others. And there is a, a more attention to structural barriers uh, like uh, motherhood or single motherhood, uh, especially uh, at the workforce and, and uh, on removing the, the structural barriers. Um, in general, femininity is seen as other. It, it has been constructed as incompatible with, uh, with science identity and physics, especially because physics remains the most masculine uh, uh, discipline of the, of the STEM. So here are a couple of uh, suggestions on how to, practical suggestions on, on how to, to support identity development, um, but mostly interventions, uh, what's necessary is intervention to support recognition by others, mother, uh, managers, colleagues, parents, the society, um, as well as interventions of removing completely structural uh, barriers. Um, 
a more recent uh, trend in the in the literature. By more recent, I mean the couple of uh, the past year. We've seen uh, two publications uh, and another one. Uh, coming out soon from one of my students, uh, an examination of how LGBTQ plus individuals experience uh, belongingness or lack of belongingness in STEM, and especially in, uh, and especially in physics. Um, and this is a preliminary preliminary findings from a systematic literature review where we found that the majority of studies are carried in the U.S. Um, gay and straight men, for example, uh, have very different experiences in, in STEM uh, studies and uh, careers. And women, uh, especially um, uh, queer, non-binary uh, women, are largely underrepresented in, in physics. Um, and this is my yeah my last bit for now. Another trend that we see in the in the literature or is uh, more intersectional uh, approaches, and Anna Maria will share more about that to an examining how gender intersects with other identities and my support or hidden hinter participation in the in the sciences. Um, you can read this uh, brief uh, opinion piece that I published uh, a couple of years ago in physics uh, that speaks about the importance of uh, adopting an intersectional approach to supporting more women engaged with, uh, with physics, not supporting women to stay in, in physics careers, but also supporting other anyone who is interested in taking any measures um, in uh, redesigning um, study and workplace environments. And with this, I pass it on to, to Anna Maria to share some big numbers. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy, so much for this. So uh, what I will show you is a preliminary work uh, that we are doing. Can you put in the previous one, please, two seconds. Yeah, so uh, in the project, uh, I'm not concentrating just in studying physics, but phys uh, we are uh, studying different fields. But uh, what uh, what I'm going to show you are preliminary results in how um, to measure bias uh, by citation rankings. So uh, ranking researchers based on citation and how this has been uh, affecting the visibility of researchers from gender and uh, also nationality and some mitigation strategies that we have. Yeah. Pass to the next, please. So, uh, a bit of my big numbers that uh, are lucky enough face and proper stories. <laughs> um, as uh, the ones of Lucy, is that we have this uh, data set that we are, we are working on uh, from Semantic Scholar that it has 200 million papers and publications uh, up to 2020 when we collected the data and we are analyzing 19 different fields. And uh, we are analyzing mainly the co authorships and the um, authorships of the papers uh, published in this data set. This data set is similar to uh, Google Scholar and is one of the most comprehensive and uh, free to use uh, data sets for studying, um, like uh, doing bibliographic uh, analysis of the um, uh, out there. So what we are doing, uh, it's a gender estimation of uh, the name of the researchers uh, with uh, a limitation to use, uh, classifying gender as a as this uh, binary sex, uh, which is the problem that uh, Lucy was mentioning, because the, right now there is um, no data about, about uh, non-binary genders and other um, non-conforming gender people, and this is something that uh, we need to address somehow. Uh, for a uh, future analysis because our mitigation strategies are uh, addressing and targeting particularly uh, those identified as women uh, for our algorithms. And this is problematic because we are helping some communities, but also we are uh, letting behind some others that we don't know. And uh, in addition, sorry. <laughs> and in addition to that, uh, we are combining also um, other tools to uh, uh, estimate the ethnicity and nationality of the researchers uh, with their last name. So there is a lot of work out there uh, right now uh, using race uh, uh, to estimate the race of the researchers, but we we find that quite problematic as race is different depending on the country. And most of the literature used uh, for the race definitions is the United States race. 
Uh, and that's problematic because uh, from that point of view, uh, you put, for example, Asia, an entire continent, uh, multiracial and multiethnic in one uh, single category. So we are trying to cope that uh, estimating nationality, which is also uh, nationalities have raised insights, but uh, a fine uh, way for adding uh, more granularity to our data. And finally, we are studying and combining these uh, two variables with the affiliation of the researchers in the moment that they published um, their papers. Uh, can you pass next, please? So uh, when we, um, so what we did was taking the papers uh, by the fields and uh, we uh, estimated the gender of the authors. And this is a, a first result of just checking uh, the gender of uh, each field. So here I'm showing you uh, these bar plots, uh, which show the proportion of women and men uh, in each one of the fields in different career stages. And uh, these fields are organized from less participation of women. So you can see that the first one is physics up to the uh, most participation of women that are uh, psychology. Um, yeah, that is psychology. So what we can see, uh, at least for the ordering, the participation of women is that to the left, that with less participation, we have mainly STEM fields. In the middle, we have um, some uh, uh, humanities and life sciences. And uh, at the end, uh, with more participation of women in the right, we have uh, a group more of the social sciences. And something uh, that we can see is that uh, there is no gender parity in any one of the fields, at least in our data set. But uh, still, uh, for social sciences, it's almost uh, half of the researchers um, are being classified as women. But also, uh, a problem that we find here, if you see the bars, uh, is that this uh, like higher parity is mainly uh, for uh, researchers uh, that are um, low ranked, that are junior researchers. So researchers that are behind the numbers uh, in terms of the citations that they have. And this is problematic because uh, the citations are a huge measure that the algorithms are using to uh, show the researchers and the importance of researchers. So we can see how the, there is a disproportion um, participation of women by all the fields, but also in their rankings uh, by the citations. Can you pass next, please? So here uh, I'm showing you, uh, so, so we are computing some fairness metrics. So uh, in this particular case, uh, this, uh, and what I'm showing here is for all the fields also, but then we will concentrate specifically on physics. And here uh, we, um, ranked all the researchers by different uh, metrics. So we have productivity as the number of papers that they have in our database, as the number of citations in our database again, and a number of co-authorships. So which, um, like uh, how many people you collaborate or you co-author papers with. And we took, uh, we ranked them from the highest values to the lowest in general per field. And then we took the first thousand women and the first thousand men, and we checked in which part of the ranking they were located. So something that uh, it's quite shocking that you can see here is, uh, for example, in physics, uh, the 1,000 first men and in, are in the around first thousand positions of the ranking, while for women, the first thousand women um, goes up to the uh, 8,000 position. So it's not fair like the way they are distributed in these rankings. And we can see how this uh, decreases when we increase the participation of women in the fields for the case of sociology or psychology, but still there is an under-representation of these women in this uh, 1,000 top positions because in the case of uh, uh, psychology and sociology, the 1,000 woman is up to the, is in uh, a position larger than the 4,000 position of the entire ranking. And also uh, we can see how this, um, changes for productivity, citations and co-authorships. And we have to uh, like read our results with granularity because there are fields that is, are more prone to work in big groups. As, uh, so some groups in physics, while uh, there are other um, as uh, philosophy that they do, uh, tend to work more in solo papers. And this uh, affects the way of uh, these metrics. Uh, next, please. So here we concentrated on a study, the physics case. So we took those 1,000 women and 1,000 men, uh, the top uh, ranked, and we uh, computed their nationality and uh, we compared it with their country of affiliation. So what you can see that is uh, quite interesting is that, uh, and here I'm doing the same, the same uh, analysis of uh, checking where they are located in the rankings. So what you can see here uh, in the up, 
uh, plots in the panels uh, for nationality uh, at first uh, is that those um, those uh, researchers, those physicists in the uh, one th top thousand that are in Asian countries such as China and Japan that are the second and the fifth bar uh, are low are lower in the ranking are further in the ranking. Well, uh, for example, Italy, uh, Germany, and uh, the Russian Federation are very high uh, in this low rank. In this uh, ranking, sorry. When we see in the country of affiliation, so the colors change uh, because the order change. So in this case, um, for example, the first country in terms of affiliation is the United States, because uh, there is an over representation of publications by countries as United States and China, and here the affiliation uh, uh, represents uh, different places where the person um like the nationality of the person. But here also interesting something that we see is again, China and Japan are behind the rankings. And we can see that uh, in the bottom um, uh, box plot and in the um, in the darker purple one. So they are behind in both cases for nationality and for country of affiliation. And this is happening uh, in general for the nationalities. What I'm showing down is uh, in the bottom in the bottom panels is that if you intersect uh, these nationalities and these countries of aff affiliations by gender, you can see that the ones that are uh, uh, pushing uh, to uh, to further uh, positions in the ranking are the rankings of women, because they tend to be really, really behind in the rankings. And you can see that in the case, for example, of those two countries that were behind as China and Japan, they is like men that are from those countries go up very high in the ranking and the women tend to go uh, really um like far and something this is interesting and this is one of the of the main um like key uh, results that <laughs> gathered the attention of lucy and that uh, we need <laughs> to collaborate more with each other because this is happening for most of the countries but for turkey and then uh, it's interesting because so we are doing this very data intensive uh, methods but we are and we get it, are getting these results but in reality we don't know why is it happening? And something that Ed, uh, Lucy was mentioning was about how in some Middle Eastern, Eastern uh, countries, uh, the gender differences uh, in science are helping, uh, sorry, are helped by science uh, to be uh, less, less different. And this is something that uh, we need to uh, explore further. And this is like a main result that I wanted to show you a bit. Can you move to the next one, please? So uh, the ongoing work that we are doing now, uh, we uh, already saw, and with some metrics, we uh, measured how it's unfair for these uh, different groups and intersected groups to be in the rankings. So we want, uh, and in our project, we are searching to uh, propose mitigation strategies for this. And then here, there is another, uh, like an important discussion about how we will mitigate this what we will be more fair and for whom this will be more fair. And we need to pro propose different strategies. We will put up in the rankings women. Uh, is this fair? We will put uh, do something called a statistical parity. That is, uh, depending on the proportion of women and proportion of men, you assign these rankings. But then, for example, in physics, that there are few women, it will penalize women as well. So we need uh, to study uh, that part. And this is our discussions in which we need to uh, try different mitigation strategies um, that uh, we want to uh, we want to try, and also how uh, we want to create diversity in the content of the researchers. Because if we put up people that works all together, uh, then it's, we are not uh, encouraging diversity of epistemologies and of knowledge and of information and different styles. Uh, and I uh, always uh, co um, thank my co-authors because <laughs> I don't do this work alone, uh, either by myself. So um, this is my <laughs> diverse <laughs> gender, uh, even a uh, group of co-authors. <laughs> and then you put me, but we are more women. But uh, my supervisor of the PhD and my current uh, boss here um, at the Complexity Science Hub. And uh, we want to invite you um, to contact us if you have more questions. If you would like uh, to um, or know where we could uh, gather subjects of a study because we want to put some like realities and faces <laughs> to all these results that we are getting and we are trying to understand why the phenomena that we are um, like finding is happening because uh, and then here uh, 
we want to study more with Lucy because we need some more mixed methods in our research because we have the numbers, <laughs> Lucy have the theory, but we need uh, to work with that. And the idea would be like in near future, design more interviews and more surveys that we can gather more information that can help us to understand the phenomena, but also give strategies to research policymakers in how to intervene the systems and like help women or other uh, minoritarian groups and underrepresented groups uh, like to be uh, to uh, feel that they belong <laughs> uh, to science and feel represented so thank you thank you Ana Maria um yeah, I'm trying to sum sum this up uh as Ana Maria said that the I guess that the main uh, conclusion to be drawn here is that there is a problem of representation. There are a series of inequalities and inequities, and uh, it's a um, systemic issue that requires a systemic approach uh, to the solution of this issue. But one thing that is clear is that we don't need any more programs to crack the gender code. We don't need any more programs to attract uh, more women um, or to support women gain an interest in science because women do have an interest in science and uh, they're, they're pushed out um, because of different uh, reasons. There's a couple of recommendations for teachers, researchers or curriculum designers. Um, and I would like to leave you with this. This is a, an opinion piece that was published at the, my university newspaper. Um, with titles Stop Trying to Fix Women. And here I exemplify indeed the problem of uh, different interventions that try to empower women while the problem is uh, with the environment uh, and not with the women. Thank you very much. Um, um, stop sharing now and I um, would love to hear from you if you have any thoughts or comments or or questions, we would love to hear more. I, I have to say that there is a, something I wanted to include, but I didn't have time uh, last night. There was a study that was published in 2019 that compared gender science stereotypes across 66 countries. And the worst country, instead of gender science stereotypes, uh, was the Netherlands meaning uh, many more uh, people uh, connect science with men and, um, and not women. And the best country, meaning the least stereotypes, was Spain. And I will, uh, I will share it with you, which means someone is doing great work at the social level uh, or groups like yourselves or... Uh, yeah, so culturally or at the societal level, uh, Spain is doing very, very well. And that's something that, uh, that's described in the literature as a gender equality paradox, because countries with a high gender equality index, like the Netherlands, Switzerland, they do actually at the social level, uh, they do really bad, even worse than developing countries or mostly majority countries that uh, quite often uh, the West is criticizing. Any question? Yeah, maybe if you want to have, share a question in um, Spanish, okay. uh, Ana Maria can. Oh, okay, Pepa. If it's easier. Pepa, cuando quieras, el micro. Thank you very much, Lucy. Can you help me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Lucy, for your interesting talk. Uh, and, and in the case of Spain, I don't know if uh, I heard that this general in other countries, uh, we have uh, a, a recent problem because uh, in the past, uh, let me say, from 19 to 20 to, to uh, the beginning of, of, the, of this century, uh, the number of women entering in in the system doing PhD was uh, were quite high, but now we 
have found, at least in my institute, I I I work in astrophysics, uh, in the Instituto de Astrophysica de Andalucía in Granada. Uh, we noticed that the number of women approaching to do a PhD is is slowly ca coming down, down and down. So that uh, can you find an explanation for this? Uh, I I I wondering I I wonder all the time what we are do, doing wrong because from the from the 2015 we have uh, the uh, February 11 where we try to visualize the scientists and also we do many things in in all the country the country uh, to increase the vocation of for physics. So that yeah. is, this is something that I am very worried about. Um, yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, inter yeah that, that's interesting. But to situate that in a larger context, there is a decline of interest towards PhD across Europe in all, um, in all topics. And this has to do with the fact that uh, there is more attention into hostile environments of, of academia. So academia is not a, it might not be a preference to many people because uh, of that. Um, the other reason is uh, that there is much more money in, in industry than in, uh, in academia. So following a career, for doing a PhD will be very likely that someone is doing a PhD because they are interested in a career in academia. But there is a decline of interest in working in academia at the European level. So I'm, I'm not surprised by that. Um, but the surprising will be if, if there is an increase in other uh, disciplines and there is a and decrease in physics alone. Does this make does this make sense? I don't know because uh, still we have uh, we have a lot of uh, people that they want to to come to the to do the PhD, but um, most of them are men, but not women. So yeah. That, the gender problem that yeah, I but can uh, understand. Okay. Yeah, but the problem I shared earlier with that with academia or a decline of interest in academia is mostly from women because of the several Me Too movements. There is more light or insights or discussion, more um, transparent discussions about harassment in uh, which is mostly on women in academia. So that might be one um, social factor that could explain this. Well, in the past, there was not so much uh, explicit uh, discussion about this. Yeah, but then, yeah, and of course, any attempt to respond to this question would be, would be a failure. Uh, yeah, we need to examine the, the larger context where this is uh, taking place. Something changed at the social uh, at the social level or at the university level. Um, is there a decrease of uh, full professors of women in physics, for example, versus men? Thank you. It's something that uh, we are uh, studying now. What mm. is happening? It's really uh, difficult to, yeah. to write down. So. Yeah, it's difficult to isolate, to isolate the, and think of a specific reason because there might be multiple reasons. Hmm. Any other question, Sonia? I, I, I have one. We, we did um, a little experiment also with, with big data and, and with rastering. We, um, followed the PhD thesis that were done in, in physics in at the University of Barcelona. 
And uh, University of Barcelona is quite particular in physics because we have very stable numbers. Like we always have like the same per percentage of women students and more or less the same percentage of uh, women PhDs and yeah. all that. It's been like this for like 30 years, I don't know. And then um, we, we saw that the PhD advisors, they were like um, the, the right proportion, taking into account the proportion of female um, professors. But what we saw is that the number of people being PhD advisors who had been PhD students at the same university was much, much lower for women. So this, this goes to, to, to underline the problem with, with retention, which I think it's, it's, I mean, University of Barcelona being more or less prestigious, we get other women from other places, but we don't retain our women. And um, I think that goes very much against the argument that women don't stay in science because they don't want to travel, because they, uh, because they have like family constraints and stuff. And I think that the, the point being retention is, is like the point we should make to change these numbers. I, I think this is super important just to underline that. Yeah, yeah. indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the problem is retention. something that we have been found I and mean, in not just in physics like in our data sets uh, is that so sociology like the social sciences are increasing a lot the number of women but uh, there is a huge injection in the young in the newest stages but to see the like in the senior stages of the career the proportions are very low mm. not that low as in physics but I still are really low and there is this huge thing of <laughs> Uh, yeah, for retention for so many different things, and uh, but it's and it's interesting because it's happening in all the fields like these problems. Uh, in the departments, you see a lot of students doing bachelors, masters, more or less the PhDs, and then postdocs, and then people, <laughs> uh, women still is dropping a lot, a lot. Also, there is this um, there are studies showing that we have well in general, uh, shorter careers than men. But uh, for two things, larger drops out, so a uh, woman uh, uh, leaving academia, but also because we entered the academic market later in biological life. Uh, and then there is a, like, a lot of explanation for that also. So then it's both sides, like difficult for women to reach 50 years of career uh, when they start at 30, for example. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Ana Maria. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Anything I'd, I'd like uh, to, to add something. I oh, belong sorry. to the Spanish Research Council. And we have followed, I mean, from, well, from 1994, the percentage of uh, women uh, staff in, in the staff staff women uh, in the different institutions and um, um, we don't move the number from 1994 1994 we have 22 percent of uh, of women research and in, in the last in the in the last report made by the the commission of uh, women in science uh, the number were 22.2 percent so that this is something so that the, my main goal reconnecting with him my previous answer that if if we come from from the time where the, there were a very high number of women entering athletes in the in the in the low career. So what will happen in the future where no women are, are entering into the system? Maybe women will disappear. In, we have to follow the behavior, but women, my guess, is the women disappear unless. We made positive action promoting it. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.
you want to say something, Lucy? Or uh, no, yeah, question? because I saw someone in in Kina. In Kina, in Kina, go Kina. on. Who also posted a comment about capitalism, and I laughed. I love microphone, Encina, the microphone. Okay. Congratulations, and Lucy and Ana Maria. I, I prefer speaking Spanish because my English is terrible. <laughs> um, ayer quería comentar que inauguramos un club de lectura en la, en la Escuela de Ingeniería, organizado por la Comisión de Igualdad. Y, y bueno, eh, bueno, afortunadamente pues apuntaron a algunas personas, pero eh, todas mujeres. Entonces aquí también tenemos un problema muy grande, porque si encima el problema de, de la falta de, de vocaciones o la falta de retención o, o todas estas déficits lo vamos a tener encima eh, que solucionar solo nosotras, pues no vamos a arreglar el problema. Entonces, eh, ¿cómo podríamos hacer para, para que... Yo entiendo que esto tiene que ser desde arriba, desde las instituciones, ¿no? Que, que tenga que haber un, un interés, ¿no? Para que, bueno, para que nuestros compañeros pues, pues se preocupen también por, porque haya este, este déficit de vocaciones o este déficit de permanencia de las mujeres o qué son los, cuáles son los factores para poder corregirlos. Porque si ellos, eh, a los que parece que el sistema privilegia, eh, no ceden sus privilegios o, o no hacen algo para cambiarlo, pues difícilmente veo que, que se vaya a revertir la, la situación. Bueno, simplemente es un comentario. Y muchas gracias porque me ha parecido una conferencia estupenda. Can I say something? <laughs> I'll say it in English because the person that I'll mention is in English. So in our lab that we are studying these gender inequalities and these intersectional lenses, um, we are men and women, like half and half, almost. Uh, the, and uh, our boss, she's a woman, and we have we are two postdocs women and one postdoc men. And uh, right now all the students, uh, the PhDs are men. And Jan Bachman, that he is here, uh, is interesting because it's also like, from as, as a man studying all these problems. And uh, I think that would be like a thing also like, like not just, as you say, not just including, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. <laughs> and not just uh, including women for the research because uh, we need uh, also show the problem to both sides. And I think uh, he is great because, uh, or at least in our bubble, <laughs> Uh, we every time see uh, more men uh, being open to talk about uh, these issues, to listen to us, to give their opinions back, uh, and also to highlight that we don't want to exclude them <laughs> at all. Uh, we want to be just more uh, diverse in general. And um, what else I was going to say? Ah, okay, sorry. And uh, so there is this uh, right now. Um, we are working with the University of Graz, that is another city uh, in Austria. And there are sociologists there that are, and uh, I've seen a movement in education. They showed me, I didn't know that part existed, but it's about a movement of citational justice. So, uh, and like the individual agency. So uh, from the systems, uh, we need a huge change, but also what we can do to do this change. So on purpose, on purpose search for researchers from these marginalized communities and cite them more, read them more the literature. Um, and there is uh, now um, some journals that are advocating for uh, like having some quotas, kind of quotas in the citations of the work, because we know and we have been seeing that the algorithms are showing us or Google Scholar like certain biased uh, results. But now that we know and we are conscious and doing more this like literacy about um, how science is biased and oppress oppressive, uh, how we could also show that. And uh, a discussion that we have here sometimes with uh, some of my colleagues is how men feel uh, uh, a bit scared of joining these book clubs because they feel that they shouldn't be there. Like, you know, like, no, we uh, maybe we will be disturbing or something. So the idea of like also telling them, no, it's a welcome space. You These are the house rules. <laughs> you need to be respectful also uh, in the in the book club, but everyone is welcome to join. Yeah, indeed. And if I can add to that, um, 
Yeah, I think that the prob it's not the problem. It's not men. It's the more masculine performances that exclude mm -hmm. men. So it's not um, necessarily the biological sex uh, that it's a problem. Um, but what we also know for res from research is that network support networks of women, like the one that you have, are really really crucial in uh, in retainment. Um, but that doesn't mean that there are not men in these uh, in these support networks. Uh, um... Okay. Any other questions? I have I have one one thinking because all you know we just celebrate some days ago the eleventh the day of uh, women and girl in science. And I think that I'm I'm being quite criticized with this acronym of STEM because you see in Spain uh, the the S of science uh, when we go to the high school we go to college to the primary college to to make experiment what we are seeing that girls okay let's go to be scientists but I will be I will be bioscientist. Or I will make a bioengineering. So what we are seeing from the statistics is that the degrees like medicine or bio things are completely uh, plenty of women and we are losing men. And this is also a, a problem that we are seeing. So, uh, may, may, but I think that from countries like Netherlands, France, or UK, or USA, STEM is more oriented to uh, to technological, or to physics, to math, to... So maybe we, we can start to... Because I have read some paper that say that we can change the acronym by PECS, that it's physics, engineering, and computer science, that that really... The, the the big problem to 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 retain people as we are saying or to to enroll young uh, women uh, because we are doing the, the a lot of things for stem at least in spain and what we are doing is we are increasing the number of women in in this bio more related with uh, caring well caring it's a different subject you know this social teacher and there are plenty of uh, women but no what do you think about the change in the acronym of stem yeah one? you're right yeah uh -huh. i'm also not a big fan uh, of stem uh, not only for the reasons that you share first is a it's a very american centric it's a very very u.s centric uh, but second it kind of um, portrays the, the sciences in a more traditional way, like in the 80s, maybe we had technology, engineering or mathematics, but and that misses out the interdisciplinary uh, component uh, within the disciplines, but also how disciplines have changed over the years. Um, so for me, I would prefer something like more general, uh, something like science, that uh, encompasses all disciplines or something very, very specific. If you want like physics and astrophysics, maybe target that instead of using STEM or more biology, then you're targeting that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, I agree with you, STEM is problematic. In different parts of the, the world, they use um, STREAM, for example, to include robotics. And in there some other really countries, really STREAM is, R is used to refer to religion. So essentially, we use acronyms that we there are no there is no shared understanding across the world about its meaning. So, hundred percent agree with you. So, maybe a last question because now it's 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 uh, almost time. Uh, there's some last question. Okay, so. If not, uh, well, it was really a privilege to have you both here. And Fina, and Fina. Yeah. Ah, do you have one? Sorry, Sonia, go ahead. Um, Fina, so I, I will. Ah, Fina, sorry. <laughs> oh. uh, thanks. Um, I, I would like uh, to, to know your opinion about uh, DORA or the new um, uh, evaluation. 
uh, without uh, um, more importance uh, for the the child and less from the uh, top uh, in the ranking, Dora or the new uh, evaluation. No sé, Ana María, si lo, si lo puedes traducir tú. Dora? The, yeah, this, oh, new, this, was, this new assessment for, for evaluation, Dora or Coara, that it's a uh, narrative curricula instead of... Uh, oh, okay, okay. Is, is the question for me or Ana María? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, uh, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement with the more narrative approach, uh, with a hesitation because uh, the risk of subjectivity of how na narrations are, are read. There is, I think there is a risk there. Ideally, I would have preferred a kind of a portfolio, a more holistic approach to to evaluation, uh, like a three sixty approach to evaluation uh, that includes, for example, if you're up for a promotion, then you will need uh, documents uh, and evaluation from students, from your group as well. Uh, not only a top-down evaluation from the community, like uh, from young children, for example. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the narrated uh, CV does have uh, some advantages. Uh, but I think there are also risks there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but... Go ahead. Do you want to say? Yeah, I was wondering what what do you think about the, about this? What are what are your thoughts? My my thought. Why well, I, I agree? Oren, yeah, Oren, mm -hmm. Oren Tina. Out on Tina. Mm, I agree. I I think is uh, has some aspect positive aspect uh, because I think it's not good to evaluate the container and not uh, the content. Um, but I think uh, also is is dangerous because it depends of uh, subjectivity of uh, Gary or of people. I think it's, it's complicated. We we don't have uh, experience because it's, it's new in Spain. It's a new a new way to evaluate. Mm. Yes, but yeah, I, thank you. I I think the last is terrible. Also, <laughs> the, yeah. the other. See, it's... Okay. Thank you. Mm. We will see. Uh... How it, the problem is that people that it's going to evaluate are not uh, they don't if they don't believe in these things. So this always is the the problem. Mm. But but I think that you know we, we in Spain we have the metric of simply the impact factor of journals. So this is not the the, the these metrics are completely you have to change metrics metrics. Okay. Yeah, I get it. So uh, now our government, our agencies are uh, looking for other metrics, other uh, indicators of our research. And this is what Anthina said, this, this is something new and we will see uh, what's happening. But I think that the motivation is very good because we really, we want to, uh, yeah, to work, to, to look for a more holistic, as you say, way of, of research. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think that we are going to stop here to stop here. I will